Well, hello. Hi, this is Andy Kaufman. I want to thank you so much for joining this end of year Google Hangout with listeners of the People and Projects podcast. I, uh, I just appreciate the real privilege it is to be able to host the People and Projects podcast and uh, get the episodes out when I can and for the feedback I get back from people. So uh, thank you so much for that. I, uh, I really appreciate it. You know, uh, today we're going to talk about some topics just related to, you know, thinking about the end of the year as well as I want to spend some time giving you some content as well. Because if you're a certified uh, PMP, you know that you need to earn those PDUs. And uh, thought I'd give you a free one there today as well. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to uh, share some slides here. You know, um, as we think about kind of the end of the year and we think about, uh, you know, how you've, uh, you know, lessons you've learned over the course of this year, what are some of the most important lessons that you've learned? I can say that a big lesson I've learned is from uh, Mr. Tom Peters. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he's kind of a crazy guy anyway. But one of the comments that uh, Tom, I, I read this year, it could be that he said it a long time ago, was this one. Whoever tries the most stuff wins. Can you relate to that? Whoever tries the most stuff wins. Now, he also has a follow-up on it that says something along the lines of, whoever tries the most stuff and screws up the fastest wins. And so I suppose there's something to that as well. But whoever tries the most uh, stuff wins. And so I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, you know, what would you say that you tried this year? You know, what would you say that you tried new this year? You know, um, I'm relatively new to the Google Hangout on air interface. So for example, uh, if you wanted to leave a comment up near the top, there's like the little grid menu thing and you could turn on the Q and A, you can leave a comment there. But I want you to think, what is it that you actually tried this last year? And that you feel like, whether it worked out great or not, you actually at least tried it. So for example, I can think of some things specifically for me this year when it comes to uh, the podcast. If you're a regular listener, you know that uh, I tried a video podcast where it had additional guests. Uh, that was that was new for me this year, and the feedback I got from it was very positive. So you can expect more of that. But that was that was helpful. I experimented with uh, Periscope, the Periscope app. If you're familiar with that one, did a couple uh, during the month of uh, I think it's the month of October. But it did a you know every Friday did an update. And I thought it was interesting. I, I won't say that it's something I feel like I am going to use on a regular basis because the content doesn't live afterwards for very long, but it was something new that was tried. Uh, as far as new tools this year, I tried uh, a number of new ones. Uh, Calendly, if you're familiar with that one. it's So when people, when I'm actually trying to schedule guests, I'm using Calendly. So that's something that is uh, relatively new. A toggle, T-O-G-G-L, to track my time is a new one. And Todoist, I changed my to-do app this year. So that's something I tried. And I, I got to tell you, I love Todoist. Uh, you're, you know, I'm not saying you have to change from one of the you know, countless number that are out there. But if, you, if you're not comfortable or if you just feel like you're not actively using a, um, a to-do app in a way that you could, uh, Todoist is a great one. And then from a, from a business perspective, you know, uh, uh, there's some new uh, new content this year, uh, a session on decision making, uh, some uh, new keynotes, uh, some doing a lot more webinars. And so the thing I just want to encourage you to consider is, are you trying enough new stuff? OK, so I mean, that's that's really the kind of the thing that Mr. Tom Peters is trying to encourage us to do, to try new stuff. So as you go into this next year, are you experimenting enough or are you pretty much just doing similar to what you're doing in the previous years, whether it's new tools, whether it's trying new approaches on things, maybe it's listening to new podcasts for that matter, but trying new things. That's the thing I would love to encourage you to do. All right. Now, one of the new sessions for me this year that I delivered many times had to do with problem solving and decision making. And I thought we'd spend some of our time here today just going through some of that content because I, it's just be my pleasure to be able to do that. But also, hopefully, as you go to the end of this year and into the start of next year, 
that you've got some things you probably have to make some decisions on, some things that you need to consider. So, um, so we're going to do that. You know, um, when you think about decision making and you think about, you know, you know, how is it that you go about making decisions? This is a, a pretty typical decision making process, right? I mean, you, you say, you know, what, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, encounter a choice, right? So maybe you can think of right now. In fact, I'd love for you to consider what are some decisions that you have to be making, you know, soon. Maybe it's on your radar screen right now. Maybe it's something you need to be deciding early next year. But you encounter a choice, and then you analyze some options, right? You say, yeah, I got to go through some options, and you make that choice. Interestingly, then you have to live with the consequences, okay? It's a pretty typical decision-making process. Well, it'd be nice if it uh, always goes that way, but this is what I want. This is what I want you to consider. Uh, you know, as as you think about decisions made in the past, whether it's your own personal decisions, whether it's decisions that you've seen your company make, maybe your boss make, uh, loved ones, maybe. Why is it? Do you think that good people? can make bad decisions, right? I mean, think about that. Now, whether, once again, whether it's at your company, why is it, do you think, that good people can make bad decisions? You know? I mean, I think it's I think it's pretty easy for us to consider, well, the reason why people make bad decisions is, well, it's the, you know, uh, it's their lack of intelligence, right? They're just not smart. <laughs> it's their lack of intelligence, or maybe their uh, lack of experience. You know, they just, um, they just, whether, whether, whether it's your particular industry, uh, wh whatever it is, they just don't have the experience. You know, they made a lousy decision there because they, uh, they, they, they just, they just don't, uh, they just don't have what it takes to make a good decision. This is sometimes referred to as the fundamental attribution error. Okay. Have you heard of the fundamental attribution error before? It says that, uh, that uh, when someone else does something that and it doesn't, you know, and you don't agree with it, well, it's it's like a character problem, you know. The, the reason why it didn't go well, like uh, let's say somebody <laughs> somebody goes off in a meeting, they get really angry, and what you say is, you know what, they have an anger management problem. <laughs> but if you do the exact same thing, well, you know, it's the principle of the matter. Right. Uh, another example would be if somebody doesn't follow up with you, you know, like, like you, you, they said they'd get back to you, you know, by Thursday. Now it's Thursday. They haven't gotten back to you. It's like, oh man, they've got a follow up issue. They, they have issues following up. And, uh, and yet when I don't follow up, well, <laughs> I'm busy. Right. So that's the fundamental attribution error. The fundamental, the fundamental attribution error comes into play when it comes to decision making. Because when someone else makes a bad decision, you know what? They got issues. You know, they're not smart enough. They don't get they don't have what it takes or or whatever. But when I don't make a good decision, well, you know what? This is bad luck. <laughs> yeah, it just didn't turn out well. Or it was beyond my control. I, I want to challenge you that when you see somebody make what you consider to be a bad decision, be careful about falling into that fundamental attribution error. It's very easy for it to come off of that way that, well, you know, the problem is them, okay? So I want to um, share an idea of a book that if you haven't seen this book, it's 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 a great one. It might be one to add to the list. Uh, I've not had the Heath Brothers on the podcast yet, but it's called uh, Decisive. And it's a just a, a really good book, how to make better choices in life and work. But one of the things that they talk about is, you know, why do we make bad decisions? Well, they, they say it's these four here. There's the na narrow framing, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what that actually means, but it's the narrow framing. There's the cognitive biases that we have. Uh, it's a subject that I'm just really fascinated with. And there's short-term emotion. <laughs> yeah, that can certainly get in the way. And then there's just overconfidence, okay? So these are the four that they say get in the way. Now, once again, I want to point out that uh, near the upper part of your screen, uh, I believe, I can't actually see your view of it, that there is a, a grid like apps, and you can click that, and there's a Q&A app, 
and you should be able to click on that and share any questions. So if you do have any questions as I go through this, uh, please don't hesitate to ask it. Okay. So let's let's talk about these four uh, these four uh, villains of decision making because if you've got some decisions to be made by the end of this year or early next year, it's very easy for these things to get in your way. So remember what the first one was? It was narrow framing, which basically says, you know what? When, when we're making a decision, we just don't think about enough options, that there are almost always more options than what we think. So um, Daniel Kahneman, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, you, know, he, you know, we've all heard perhaps of uh, what you see is what you get, right? We think about that with word processing systems or publishing systems. What you see is what you get. What you see on the screen is what you're actually going to get on the paper. Well, he, he actually changes that a little bit. What you see is all there is. Okay. Now think about that. What he's basically saying is it's very easy when we're kind of considering something, whether it's on a project, whether it's with a person, that the data that we see, we act as if that's all there is. Now, of course, we would never admit to that. Yeah, we'd never say it that way. But in practice, in practice, we act as if that's true, that what we see is all there is. It's almost like uh, some, some uh, uh, neuroscience folks talk about it, almost like a mental spotlight, that when we're making this decision, we look at here, this mental spotlight, and the other data that's around it, or in this case, the other options, just, you know, they just don't seem like they're, uh, you know, something to consider. And so um, you may recall, it was a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, I had uh, Gary Klein on the podcast, and he talked about his book, uh, Seeing What Others Don't. And uh, he, he talks about in that book that the more central a belief is to us, just the more difficult it is for us to give up our belief on that. So this is not the narrow framing nearly as much as the cognitive bias that, that if we just, you know, confirmation bias would be an example of a cognitive bias that we just feel like, you know what, the, of course this idea is gonna work because it just, it's so central to my belief. So for example, sometimes we commit to timeframes on projects. And we commit to that time frame and we look for the data that supports so we can hit that time frame because if we can't hit that time frame, we're not going to look good. And so we just look for the data, all kinds of cognitive biases that uh, we can easily fall prey to. And then so we have narrow framing, we have cognitive biases, and we'll talk more about some of those. And then there's just short-term emotion. It's just easy for, for us to get uh, swayed because of short-term emotions. Have you ever said... Uh, Somebody, somebody is is right in front of you. They're in a meeting or you pass them in the hallway and they ask you to show up for some, hey, would you be willing to come to this meeting or would you be willing to do this? And what you, you know the right answer is no. <laughs> but we say yes. And why do we say it? Sometimes it's the social awkwardness of, being, of saying no. Well, I have to say it. yes. It's my boss or whatever. Well, sometimes our decisions are swayed by these social pressures. And these short-term emotions. There's a great story of um, of uh, Andy Grove, and it was Gordon Moore at Intel. And uh, back in the day at Intel, they made their money off of memory chips. It wasn't as much processors as memory chips. And, and yet, you know, the margins on memory chips were you know going down. And they're like, you know, should we stay in memory chips or not? And it was it was a very difficult decision because there was so much emotion tied in this. This is what we do. And they finally asked a question. It's a really fundamentally important question. They said, hey, you know what? Let's say we got fired and they brought in a new CEO. What would that new CEO decide? And they looked at each other and they said, you know what? That new CEO, they'd get us out of the memory chips. They'd get us out of it. It just doesn't make sense. And by doing that, uh, it, it helped them make the decision. Short-term emotion can sway us. Now, this is going to sound crazy, but you know what? If you've listened to the podcast long enough, you know I'm not exactly normal in some of that stuff. So um, I, uh, I've thought about this before, that if I died and my wife remarried, what would he do? How would he treat her differently than I do? 
And that's got to make me think of like, hey, you know, <laughs> maybe I should be doing that stuff now too. It's, it might seem like a silly example, but the point is, is that, you know, we often are too close to something, whether it's the narrow framing, whether it's the cognitive bias, there's the short-term emotion, it gets in the way of us making the good decision. And then uh, finally, there is the overconfidence. You know, uh, sometimes what happens is uh, we make bad decisions because we think we know more than what we do, okay? Uh, check out this quote from uh, Daniel Borston. He says that uh, the greatest enemy of knowledge, it's not ignorance, <laughs> it's the illusion of knowledge. I tell you, I love that quote. It's, 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 not, it's not ignorance, it's not that, that people are stupid, it's that we think we know. Or uh, as Mark Twain said, he said it a little bit differently. It ain't what you, <laughs> it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Okay, isn't that a good quote? That um, when we're making decisions, you know, we feel this this confidence, and yet, you know, in the scheme of things, is there data? Is there data that we're not looking at? Often there is. And so, in fact, if this is, an, if this is the decision-making process here, if this is the decision-making process that we have, well, you know what? You encounter a choice, but what happens? It's narrow framing. It gets in the way. All right? We have to analyze our options, but, doggone, you know, it's that confirmation bias that gets in our way. And so we just look at the data that, you know, tells us what we want it to say. You know, we go to make a choice, but it's that short-term emotion that can tempt us to go astray. And then, of course, you know, you have to live with the consequences, but maybe we stay overconfident even when we're getting data that might suggest that this isn't a good decision. So, how do we deal with this? What are some what are some ways to, you know, make better decisions? Well, how about this? We widen our options. We'll talk about that. How do you widen your options? How do we reality test our assumptions? How, how, how do we get a little distance before we make this decision? How do we get a little distance? And then how about this one? Prepare to be wrong, okay? Now, the Heath brothers suggest this um, acronym, RAP, and I think it's a good one because it actually does a nice job of summarizing or helping us to remember how to make better decisions. And it starts with this one, the widen our options. So let's talk about this one. Uh, as it says here in, in front of you, watch out for anytime you say you're trying to decide whether or not to, okay? You ever do this? Yeah, I'm trying to decide whether or not to go to the opening of Star Wars. I'm trying to decide whether or not to, uh, you know, I mean, we're not talking about little decisions like, should I go to lunch here or go to lunch there? That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about bigger decisions. I'm trying to decide whether or not to th think about the options we have as uh, project managers. We have options to, uh, you know, trying to decide or not whether we should include this requirement or not. Should we kill this project or not? Should we propose that we can bring that team member on or not? I mean, there, there are all kinds of examples where, you know, there's more options, you know, like check out this example on the screen. Um, a college student's trying to decide whether or not they should go to the party tonight. Okay. Now, it doesn't seem like there are many options. It's either go to the party or don't go to the party. Right? That's kind of what it seems like my options are. But can you think of some additional options? Well, sure. Yeah, there's some additional options. Like maybe it's instead of just study or go to the party, it might be, hey, well, one option might be study and then go to the party later. It might mean, well, you know what? I, um, <laughs> I, instead of going to that party, maybe I'll invite some of the friends over and have a different party. You know what? Maybe what I'll do is I'll study and then I won't go to that party, but I'll go to the after party. My point is, there are almost always more options than what we realize, okay? And so whenever you find yourself saying, ah, trying to decide whether or not, trying to decide whether or not, use that as a trigger. Use that as a trigger of, wait, 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 wait. There are more options to that, you know? Should we delay the project or not? 
well, wait a minute. Are there some other constraints we can, you know, can we defer some scope? Can we negotiate for some more people? It's not just as simple as delay or not. It, it tries to spur us on to look for more options. Okay. Um, should we hire this person or not? Well, it seems like that's a two state thing, but is there an option for, well, uh, spending a little bit more time getting a referral, spend a little bit more time checking out their LinkedIn profile. My, my point is almost always there are more options. And I see this all the time. So be careful whether or not, be careful about the whether or not. Um, let me give you an example of this. It's a, a little case study I like to use when I uh, do this particular class. It's uh, Quaker. Uh, back in 1983, they acquired Gatorade, $220 million, okay? All right pretty decent deal. Um, you know what's a better deal? The CEO, William Smithberg, he helped grow it to $3 billion. <laughs> Wow, right? I mean, that's a pretty, that's awesome, man. You grew it from uh, $220 million to $3 billion. Well, all of a sudden, they start getting a little itchy. And now we have an opportunity to, hey, let's get Snapple. Snapple's on the market. And uh, offers 1.8 billion, and I mean this created a pretty big, uh, pretty big debt burden for uh, for Quaker. But the interesting thing about the whole debt burden thing was that's actually okay because some people um, were maybe going to look at trying to buy them out. So instead of a hostile takeover, it's a bit of a you know make us a little less attractive. And we got the magic touch, you know. We uh, yeah you know, we grew Gatorade, so. You might want to guess what happened, right? Well, it's probably not going to be a happy story here. So um, what happens? Well, it's a different business. <laughs> it was a different business than what Gatorade was. Sold it three years later for $300 million. Now, do you remember what he bought it for? Yeah, it was a lot more than that. And uh, sold it for only $300 million. And he ended up stepping down as a CEO. And the interesting thing here is what Smithberg said. There was just so much excitement, so much excitement bringing in a new brand, you know, a brand with legs. We, we should have had a couple people arguing the no side of the evaluation. Isn't that interesting? Evaluating the no side. Who is evaluating the no side? Do you have a decision that you're facing right now? Are you talking to the people that are – maybe saying this is just a good idea or maybe you're talking to only people that are saying no and you need to have someone else bringing you know bringing some ideas in but in the quaker example it really wasn't even a yes or no smith later said he said really it was this is what we're going to do it was between kind of yes or yes what would it take to make it happen that's what they did so that's even more dangerous and so the the, the problem with the whether or not is it has us asking the wrong question because it's very easy for this to turn into what's the data that supports this? What would it take to make it work? Who do I need to get their buy-in? Who? How do I need to socialize to make this happen? And then we're just staying blind to what's going on instead of saying, is there a better way? So first lesson here, learn to distrust the whether or not sort of decisions. Be very, very careful about that. Okay. So, um, if, uh, if somebody's watching this later on, then they don't know that uh, today, or at least tonight, is the opening of the new Star Wars, okay? And so um, I've got one son in particular who's kind of of a Star Wars geek, and so he's like, hey, you know what, Dad, you want to go? I'm like, of course. So we're going to go to a late night uh, opening of it tonight. But there's a guy named uh, Shane Frederick, a researcher, and he did this, he did this uh, uh, study that he'd go up to people and say, all right, now you've got, uh, there's a new 3D movie that's coming out and you've wanted to see this movie. And so the option is, it's, it's a whether or not decision. Option one, go to the movie. Option two, don't go to the movie. And let, let's say it was going to cost $15 to do it. So um, uh, go to the movie, don't go to the movie. And he'd ask people, well, what would you do? I mean, most people say like 75% of the people said, we're going to go to the movie. Okay. What he did was, he had a slight change, right? So check out this slight change to um, to the uh, the request. It says, "Go to the movie or don't go to the movie, and keep the fifteen dollars for 
<laughs> other purchases. Okay. All right. So uh, what do you think happened when it was framed that way? Go to the movie or don't go to the movie and keep to the $15. They could change it all. Yeah, for sure. In fact, 45% of the people said, don't go. That was almost um, double, almost double the number of people that, uh, that, that said no. All right. So just to, just imagine if somebody at Quaker would have said, <laughs> buy Snapple or, Hey, you know, let's not buy them and let's keep the one, you know, the 1 1.8 billion for other purchases. All right. Isn't, uh, do you think that would have actually changed things? So uh, an example of this is we're thinking about getting away near the end of the year and we're looking at different options and our, our, our kids have not really skied on big mountains. I mean, they, I live in Illinois, right? So a mountain is a very slight incline. It's, it's what everyone else in the world would call maybe a hill. But we've looked at some of the pricing and between Christmas and New Year's, the price per day for the lift tickets and the lodging. And so we're like, you know, we could spend it, but what else could we do with that? You know, and this is what the widen your options gets, gets us to think through. What if we would look at it differently? Now, here, here's one other idea, and it's it's called the vanishing options test. How does that work? All right, so let's say you're trying to decide, oh, man, do I do this? Do I do this? The vanishing options test works like this. In fact, I'll give you an example. Uh, this guy used to be on my staff. He moved to a different city. Uh, great leader. Uh, rose really well within the ranks of the company that he went to, got let go during a reorganization. Okay. So I call him and uh, just ask him, how's it going? You know, how, uh, you know, a a any irons in the fire, we might say. Yeah, what, are, what are the options? And, you know, he, he was trying to be upbeat. He goes, well, you know, I got a potential with this one. I got a potential over there. You know, they haven't got back to me yet. But, you know, no, I think, I think we got, got some chances here, right? Pretty typical conversation. Um, what I read into that conversation, though, was maybe things weren't quite as optimistic as he was hoping. Okay, But regardless, whether they were or not, the way the vanishing options test works, and this is what I did to him, I said, hey, you know what? Let's say there were two options he was thinking about. Let's say those two options just go away. Both of them call you later today, and they go, boom, gone. No option. Now, that's not a very friendly uh, thing for me to say, but then I asked him. I'm going to say his name was Mark. His name was not Mark, but I'm going to say his name was Mark. I say, hey, Mark, what would you do? And, you know, Mark was actually a little quiet. And he said, well, I'd probably consider consulting. So the thing I suggested to Mark is, why don't you consider consulting now? Okay. So if you're trying to think through a decision right now and you're like, well, you know, I got some irons in the fire. I got some options here. Try the vanishing options test. All those go away. What would your next best option be? In, uh, in negotiating, it's called the BATNA. What's my best alternative to a negotiated agreement? What's, it's, what's my plan B? Well, you know what? When it comes to our decisions, we often don't think about the plan B. The vanishing options test can do it. So, so how many options is enough? Well, uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini's research said that you know, if, you, if you offer people too many options, which would be if you offer yourself too many options, it's counterproductive. So this is what I found. Try to come up with at least two options that you can fall in love with, okay? Because the danger is if you fall in love with just one option, you'll, you'll just confirmation bias. You'll just look for the data that supports that one. Can you fall in love I know you should reserve love for people, but can you fall in deep, enduring like <laughs> for at least two options that you could be okay with this option or that option? And if you can do that, that's, uh, that's probably pretty good. So when it comes to widening your options, when it comes to you know making a better decision, widening your options, how about this? Distrust whether or not decisions. Try maybe the vanishing options test and try to fall in love with at least two, how about this, distinctly different options, okay? That can help you. All right, so that is the W, the widen your options. How about the reality test your assumptions? How about that? Reality test your assumptions, okay? So um, part of the problem of reality testing our assumptions is we just don't get enough dissenting opinions. 
Now, maybe you might be thinking, oh, man, I am surrounded by people at my company who give dissenting opinions. <laughs> I mean, oh, my goodness, they're always shooting down ideas. Well, I, I suppose maybe. But um, how, about, uh, how about this quote from Alfred Sloan? You familiar with uh, Alfred Sloan? He, uh, he said it this way. Check out this quote. He says, gentlemen, I take a wrong complete agreement on this decision here. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he continues. Then I propose we postpone further discussion on this matter until our next meeting to give ourselves time to develop disagreement and perhaps gain some understanding of what this decision is all about. <laughs> all right. So think about a typical corporate meeting. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that's, that's not what we're doing. What we're doing instead is we're like, oh, good. Everyone's agreeing with me. No one is pushing back. Whew, good. Right. Or you bring up an idea and everyone's like, yeah, all right, whatever. Yeah, they think, um, all right, so that, that's that's okay. You know? So it's, it's, it's tempting to think when we have everyone agreeing that it's all good. So, uh, you know, I want to, I want to point out that, uh, Arif, by the way, it's, uh, it's good to see that you're here, man. Thank you for doing that. Uh, do you think this works for the urgent decision-making? Well, um, you know, if, you know, urgency, there are different levels of urgency. And so one way I've learned to deal with this one is, and I don't, I don't even remember who I learned it from, but they said, sometimes things seem really urgent, but ask the question to yourself, when does my risk profile change? All right. So like if, if I'm walking across the street and all of a sudden there's a horn that blows, I don't go through and say, I could dive. I could try to duck under, right? I mean, you know, I, there's the risk profile changes instantaneously, but let's say there's something urgent. Do I have an hour? Like is, is something going to change? The context of where, how I learned it was someone said, let's say, let's say, uh, you know, God forbid you get a, um, a diagnosis and you got to decide, do I, do I take, do I get chemo or not? Oh man. I mean, that's a pretty big decision, right? Well, the question is, when does my risk profile change? Can I take an extra day and think this through or do I have to make the decision right now? Um, I wonder sometimes if we use the urgency, I, I know I do this, as an excuse not to think through of more options. And so I would say at least something to consider of even on something that seems relatively urgent, is, is there a way, is there a way to take some time and think it through, widen the options, and then maybe pass it by some people. Give me the reason for why I shouldn't do this and stay open-minded to it. That's really what we're talking about here of the reality testing of get some people that can say, you know what, is this a good idea or not? Okay. Let's say, you know, with uh, this being a, a, a big gift buying uh, time of the year and you, you're going to buy something off of an online retailer and it shows, right, you've got these different stars for this product you want to buy. Well, it's like 401 five stars, you know? That's good. There's a couple of, you know, like 53 whiners out there, but look at all these other ones. So which ones are you more likely to review? Well, there's actually some data to suggest, and they looked at 91 studies, 8,000 participants. They concluded were twice, more than twice as likely to favor the confirming information instead of the disconfirming, okay? So what that means is if you really, really want it and you want to buy that off of amazon.com or wherever, if you really want it, you're more likely to spend time looking at those five-star reviews and you're like, ka-ching, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I got it, and ignore those uh, one stars, okay? Now, I'm not saying that, I mean, the, the one-star people might be a bunch of whiners, you know, it might be, but... Look for the disconfirming data, especially the more that you feel like you've uh, kind of fallen in love with this, okay? Because our uh, whether it's the cognitive biases or maybe even the short-term emotion, it's going to draw us into those five stars. I need this, okay? So some ways to uh, you know get some more divergent thinking. Check this out here. Asking the questions, yo, what are the assumptions we're making? It's actually a really good project management question to ask when you're running a project, yeah. What are the underlying assumptions? I love the question, what must be true for this to be a really good idea? Or what must be true on a project? I love this question. What must be true for my plan to work? This would say, you know, if I'm going to make a decision, what are some underlying assumptions I'm making? 
you know, is there a way to validate these things? Um, by the way, these questions are from uh, Michael Roberto. Uh, Mike's been on the uh, podcast twice before. This is from his book, Why Great Leaders Don't Take Yes for an Answer. And really, the subject of that book is along the lines of what we're talking about here. How can we do this? What, what, what are some obstacles that can get in the way, right? We, listen, if you're, if you're related to project management at all, this is risk management, right? We're trying to force ourselves to think about these. How might these other people react? What are some other options? What risks? What risks? What would have to be true for this decision to be best, right? So my, my point on this one is if you're not seen, if, it's, if the divergent thinking is not coming up naturally, you have to force it. You have to look for ways to force it to come up. Okay. So um, in uh, uh, Michael Roberto's book on the, that we just talked about, he, he has this quote. He says, you know, managing the tension between conflict and consensus. It's one of the most fundamental challenges of leadership. Okay? One of the most fundamental. Now, when, now, when he says between conflict and consensus, well, what's he talking about there, right? So we need consensus, but we also need some conflict, right? And it's finding the balance because if it gets too far on the conflict side, that's not going to be good. But if it gets too much on the consensus side, that's not going to be good either. Right? I mean, that could just be a sign that people don't even care. So one of the things that um, uh, Mike talks about, he calls it uh, affective uh, and cognitive conflict. So the idea of cognitive conflict is this is the good. I mean, this is the good kind of conflict. This is this is the conflict where it's about the ideas. You know, it's it it, it might even get uh, be a vigorous discussion, it might even be a vigorous discussion, but it's not spilling over to what he calls the affective conflict. Now, this is the dangerous one on the affective conflict. This is where all of a sudden people are, you know, they're getting into fights. They're like, well, you know what? comma, loser, about that idea, right? I mean, where they're insulting each other or the, the, even if the words are not disrespectful, the, um, you know, the tone, the body language is definitely coming across of like, you are an idiot. Okay. And so what you have to think through is when you're coming up with your, you know, decisions, are you having enough cognitive conflict? Is it spilling over to affective? Because if it's spilling over to affective, that's a problem, okay? So Mike suggests some ideas on things like how many disagreements were there, you know? How, when you, if, you were, if you were asking around, you're saying, all right, uh, anybody have a problem with this, okay? Does anybody have trouble um, supporting this? If you ask questions like that, uh, and there's, there's not enough, I mean, it might just be it's an obvious decision, but are, are there differences about the content? If this is a pretty big decision, you should be getting some of that. The alternative is how much anger was there? How much personal friction was there? And if you get a lot of that where it's the personal friction where you feel like after the meeting, you know, I, I, need, to, uh, I need to go clean this up with people. I, I think I've got a little cleanup work to do. Then uh, maybe that's spilling over to that affective, right? So under reality test assumptions, those are some examples of an idea. One last idea, uh, the Heath brothers call it um, ooching, <laughs> O-O-C-H, ooching. What that means is uh, when you're trying to make a decision, you know what, should we do it all? Is it this or that? But really one of the options might be, do we have to do it all or could we do it a little bit? Like, um, uh, I back, I mean, this is like 1994. I started getting the sense of, I wonder, you know, so I was, I was, uh, in a leadership role in an IT organization, but I started speaking at conferences and, uh, some people would come up to me and say, Hey, uh, do you do this for a living? And I'd be like, you can do this for a living. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. And so, um, I kind of get the sense of, I wonder if I could do that. I wonder if that would be a good, I wonder if I'd like it. I wonder if I could make any money at it. You know, I just didn't know. So one option is quit the job and give it a try. And some people do that. But Uchin says, no, you just pick a couple conferences a year and go speak there. Uh, pick a couple user groups, go speak there, right? So that would be an idea. I had um, uh, Peter Sims on the podcast. This must have been like three or four years ago. And he wrote a book called 
little bets, little bets. And it's the same sort of idea. Can you, instead of saying, hey, let's make this big decision, like quit the job or uh, 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 sign off on this project, authorize this project or kill this project. Is there a way to say, could we, how about this? Let's authorize a prototype or just an initial part of this instead of the whole thing. So uh, uh, the Heath brothers call it Uchin. Um, Peter Sims calls it little bets. If I remember, Jim Collins calls it uh, uh, shooting, how do you say, it? fire bullets and then cannonballs. I think that's what it was. And so the point is, listen, instead of diving in, can we dip our toe in the water? Okay. So that's kind of the idea. And so when we think of uh, kind of some key lessons from this whole thing, what, are, what can we do to uh, foster cognitive conflict and, and look for some disconfirming data? If you've got a decision that's on your plate, on your radar screen right now, look, and you feel like you're really going that way, look for the disconfirming data. <laughs> we, uh, uh, you know, kind of in the line of this, I mentioned the, uh, you know, maybe getting away for a skiing vacation. So one of my sons was checking out um, Vermont. Okay. So if you're from the States, you know, it's in the Northeast. Um, if not, if you're not from the States, it's not necessarily, you know, when, when you, we think in the United States of skiing, you think of the Rocky Mountains and uh, think of that. Vermont, you wouldn't necessarily normally think of unless you're from Boston. Well, we thought, well, the great thing about this is less people will be there. And look at the price per night. Oh, it's so much better. And, uh, we looked at some reviews about the place we we're thinking about. Sounded pretty good. And then we, <laughs> the disconfirming data was, hey, real quick, let's check out their webcam. <laughs> Do they have any snow? Because Chicago has been kind of warm lately. And it's been a pretty mild winter for the most part. And we looked at the webcam and patches of grass forecast for the next week. No snow. <laughs> so, you know what? It was not looking good. So if you want to reality test your assumptions, you know what? Look for disconfirming data. Is there a way to ooch? Well, with the skiing, we can't ooch, but it's for you. Is there a way to partly do it? Okay. All right. So, you know what? Those are some ideas. How about this? We've talked about the widen your options. We talked about reality testing your assumptions. How about attaining some distance? Let's attain some distance. What are some ways to do that? Well, this kind of gets to the issue of emotions. You know, um, I feel like sometimes there's pressure to, you know, take emotion out of it. In business, it's got to be all objective, you know? It's like be Spock or something like that. And, you know, emotions can help, right? I mean, there's times where emotions can help. You know, like if you're trying to convince somebody of something and you show a little passion about it, maybe you're more likely to show that you care, or that it's a good idea. But if everything is just like too cold or, or uh, too calculated, yeah, you know, it could show, it could come off as you don't care. Think about leaders. I can think of uh, national leaders, maybe even international leaders that kind of come off that way sometimes. And yet emotions can get in the way because it can, it can just muddy the water, so to speak, that it, it, can, it can just get in the way of our message. And as we talked about it, with decisions, it can just cause us to make decisions that we shouldn't. So um, I did a podcast on this long time ago. This might be even five years ago, but I did not interview Susie Welch, Jack Welch's uh, uh, wife, but I talked about it and it's called the 10, 10, 10 process. So the idea that 10, 10, 10 is you say, all right, I've got a decision to make. How will I feel about this decision 10 minutes from now, 10 months from now, and 10 years from now? What it's trying to force is how do I feel about short term? How do I feel about it long term? Okay. So, um, you know, there's some times where it might be the short term decision is do I confront this person on my team or not? You know, 10 minutes from now, and let's say I decide not to. Okay. 10 minutes from now, I just feel better. I didn't have to have that tough dis discussion. 10 months from now, I'm still dealing with the same stuff. 10 years from now, this is that same person that's being bounced from team to team to team because nobody wants them, right? Confront the person. 10 minutes from now, it will not be a fun conversation, but 10 months from now, maybe the performance is better or they're gone. But still, the 10, 10, 10 tries to get us to evaluate the short term and the long term, okay? It's a pretty handy idea. So um, another idea, and this comes from, this comes from the Heath brothers, is... Um, you're trying to make a decision, what would you advise a friend to do? 
Okay. <laughs> you know, if, the, if you had a friend that had to make that same decision, what would you advise them to do? So an example of this is my wife, uh, if, if, if one of her friends is saying, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to decorate something or, or clean out their closet, my wife can go in and be like, all right, and she can help them make the decisions with huge confidence. But she, what, what she, my, my wife Sarah says, she goes, when I have to do it for myself, she goes, I have the hardest time. Now, part of that's a short-term emotion. Like, I've had this outfit for like 15 years and surely it'll come back in style, right? I mean, I, I mean, she, she's never said that. You know, that's something I would say. But the, the point is, that thing about a friend, if you had a friend that had to make a project decision, a hiring decision, what would you recommend they do? The example they give in the um, decisive book is um, a college student. They're trying to decide, uh, hey, you know, uh, it was, they went to guys and they say, hey, you know, there's, let's say there's a girl in your, uh, in your class. And you're like, you're, you're thinking about asking her out, but you really don't know her very well. So you're trying to decide whether or not, right? That's the trigger. That's a potential problem. Whether or not to ask her out on a date. Option one, ask her out. Two, wait until you get to know her better, okay? So as, uh, I don't know whether you might guess or not, uh, most guys said, uh, I think I'll wait until I get to know her better. But when they said, hey, your friend is thinking about asking her out or uh, you know, getting to know her better, what would you recommend? Overwhelmingly, they said, go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Give her a call. So there's something about maybe this ask a friend. Okay. You want a you want a little way to kind of deal with a, get, you know getting a little distance. Yeah. You know, what would you recommend a friend do? Look for uh, consider that maybe that ten ten ten. You know, just just realize that if I've got if I've got a lot of emotion, if I if I maybe have fallen in love with it too much. Uh, maybe you recall earlier this year Peter Bregman's book Four Seconds we talked about in that podcast where it's just like, you know, take the deep breath. Take the deep breath. Maybe, maybe I want this too badly, and the emotions kind of getting in the way. All right. So we've talked about the uh, the widen your options reality test, attaining some distance. How about this? Prepare to be wrong. <laughs> Prepare to be wrong. You know, um, let's say as it says here, a company's trying to decide: uh, do we kill this project or do we keep throwing money at it? Do we kill it? Right? Or do we keep putting money at? A lot of times companies focus on, well, listen, let's not give up. Let, you know, let's let's be persistent. Let's be persistent on this. You know, it, it, sometimes it's hard to know. Is this just persistence or, or, or is this denial of reality? Right. And it's easier to know after the fact. Okay. This is like with overconfidence. Was it overconfidence? <laughs> or, you know, or, or was it bold leadership? Because if it turns out bad, overconfidence is something we ascribe to it when it turns out to be a bad decision, All right? If it turns out to be a good decision, oh man, you are just a, uh, a bold leader, okay? So it's difficult to know sometimes, is this persistence or denial of reality? This is the idea of prepare to be wrong. And this is where I feel like as project managers, we are in a perfect place to think about this. Think about it in terms of risk management. So, you know, with basic risk management, what we know is you identify the risks and then you rate them out and then you come up with plans to deal with it, right? I mean, that is like basic PMBOK guide risk management. And the, the issue is with the identifying the risks, it's very easy to just identify the risks that my mental spotlight sees, right? That I don't open it up to other people. And so... Um, if you recall from my interview with uh, Gary Klein, so if you didn't see it, I want to say it was a year ago, August. Uh, so just look up Gary Klein, but he talked about pre-mortems. Remember that if you're, if you uh, were listening back then. So the idea of a pre-mortem is you get your team together and you say, all right, we've got this project is due in six months. You know, we're, we're kicking it off. Um, let's fast forward the clock and it's uh, six months from now and let's see how the project went. And, uh, oh, the software bombed or nobody showed up at the event or uh, our customers hate it. We're getting terrible reviews in the press, whatever it is. Um, a pre-mortem says you transport yourself kind of cognitively into the future and you look back, you admit that it's a failure, and then you go around the room and, and try to identify, well, what would have caused that? Okay. Now, I didn't really give it justice here, but if you're intrigued by that at all, go back and listen to that podcast episode 
And uh, I have found when it comes to risk management, it's a great way to prepare to be wrong up front. Um, I think the reason why it works is it forces us to acknowledge that this might fail. I do this with my PMP prep students. We'll do this. Uh, it's the day of the event. You're ready to click. You've, you've just gone through four hours, 200 questions. You click, are you done? And, and then it says, are you sure? And you're like, ah. And it comes up, you failed, right? Now, almost always when I do this, someone in the room goes, huh? Ah, you know, because this sort of approach, I think the reason why the pre-mortem works is it forces us uh, at, a, at a visceral level to acknowledge that we can fail. So one way to prepare to be wrong is to actually do risk management. Remember, good risk management says on two dimensions, probability and impact. How likely is it that something will cause this to be a wrong decision? How likely is it? How bad would it be? And you kind of multiply those together or you take the highest combinations of those two and you come up with plans to deal with it. I'm telling you, um, since life is a project, maybe you need to be thinking about risk management more in your life decisions, not just your project decisions. Uh, one of the ideas I love from the Decisive book is they say, set a tripwire. And if it's a tripwire, like let's say that um, let's say that someone says, hey, you know what? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I can hit uh, a date two weeks from now. I think I can, but I'm not sure. And let's say it's on the critical path, and you're like, oh man, it's going to delay the project if they don't. <sighs> Do I delay the project? Do I just hope for the best? You know, how do you deal with this? Well, the idea, prepare to be wrong, right? Let's go with the plan, but prepare to be wrong. Set a tripwire, let's say five days into it. And if we're on track five days from now, great. Maybe we set another tripwire. But if we're already delayed five days into this two-week thing, then you know what? Maybe what we do is we start doing some preventative action or some sort of corrective action now. When you're making a decision, uh, somebody told me recently that I want to open a restaurant. And I really like this person. And what I wanted to say was, that is such a brilliant idea. But I went through a lot of what we're talking about today because the data on opening restaurants, unless it's a franchise and a chain with all kinds of proven processes and already strong supply chain, oh my goodness, the, the data is terrible. But something that you can do, whether it's a restaurant or you have an idea is, hey, listen, try new stuff, right? That's how we started out today. Try new stuff, but set a tripwire that if by this date, you're not earning money, or by this date, certain things haven't happened, you know what? I'm gonna at least prepare to be wrong so I don't flush all my 401k or my savings or things like that. So this idea of setting a tripwire helps us prepare to be wrong, but it also allows us to be calm during that process, all right? All right, listen, I've got time to develop. We have time to try to make this work. Um, but the problem is time will sometimes just go and go and go. Here's an example. Um, uh, this, I think this is from the Decisive book. A lady goes, you know what? I want a vacation to Argentina someday. I want a vacation to Argentina. Okay. But she's relatively new in her job and uh, recently married, and her and her husband were like, you know, now's just not the night. We don't have the money for it. Then they had kids. They're like, well, the kids are too young. You know, it'd be terrible to take them there. When they're that young, they won't remember it. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, school schedules. And then, oh, we got to save for college. Now the kids are out. And, uh, oh, but work is so demanding. Um, we'll wait till retirement. Then they retire. And physically, the trip would be too demanding. The question on the table is, when did she decide to not go to Argentina? When did she make that decision? You know what? I think she'd say, I didn't make that decision. I never decided. But the point is, without setting a tripwire, oh, yeah, yeah, you made that decision, all right. You made that decision. So my point is, prepare to be wrong. Make a decision, but just say, what, what would be a tripwire out there to say, maybe this wouldn't be a good decision? Or can I do a little risk management to identify some things that could go wrong and put some things in place for now? Okay. So... Let's actually check uh, check this out. So we've got the uh, we've got the wrap, right? The what does the W stand for? You encounter a choice. What do you want to do? You want to widen your options, right? The R. You analyze your options, but the problem is we don't reality test. So we need to reality test our assumptions. All right? You want to make a choice, but we need to get some distance. 
maybe it's just that little breath, that long breath maybe, or something to get a reality check on that. And the decision is made, but how about this? Prepare to be wrong. You know what? I found that this rap process just really makes it easier for us to kind of think it through of what can we do to make better decisions? Well, I also want to um, kind of challenge you with this, that it's not just you making decisions. You've got people on your teams that are making decisions. And what I want you to consider is there might just be some things that you're doing that's getting in the way of them making good decisions, okay? Like when they bring a decision to you, um, do you just like, oh, that'll never work, never work. Or, um, uh, you know, we cast a long shadow. So do we stay open-minded to what the, you know, do we shoot down the ideas right away? Do we encourage them to come up with more options? So um, do, how about this? Do we seek dissenting data from them? So think about your role as a leader with your teams. What are you doing to help? You know, kind of one last thing related to our topic today. Uh, a guy I would I haven't approached him yet to get him on the podcast, but this Phil Rosenzweig, he wrote this good book called uh, Left Brain Right Stuff, and I, I love this. That that a lot of times, and maybe this goes to Arif, uh, your comment about um, you know urgency. Sometimes to make the good decisions, the winning decisions. You know, it's really two different skills. There's the left brain. He calls it the left brain and the right stuff. So there's this analytical stuff, right? Go through the rap process. We have to do that. There's the rap stuff. But there's also a willingness to take the risks, that every decision has risk. It's not going to come down to just some simple formula that's going to help us make these decisions. And so it's that combination of the left brain and the right stuff. That's what we're trying to do, okay? And sometimes, sometimes, and I guess, I, and I got this from, um, I don't even remember the name of the author or the book, but he interviewed uh, people in their 70s and 80s and 90s about lessons for living. And one of the things I took from that podcast was, um, how do you say it? Unless there's a compelling reason not to, decide yes, okay? So err on the side of doing that. That's kind of that, Left brain, do the an analyzing, but the right stuff, make the call. Unless there's a compelling reason to say no, say yes. Okay. Well, you know what? As we uh, look to wrap today up, you have earned your PDU, man. So uh, uh, remember that wrap process? Remember that? And uh, I'd encourage you, experiment with this stuff. Try some of these ideas. Uh, if you've got a decision that's coming up in the near term, Man, try it. You know, widen your options. If you have uh, if you have any questions that come up as a result of our discussion here, man, don't don't hesitate to uh, send me an email. Um, I'd I'd love your feedback on this process. Did you uh, did you think this was a, a good idea today to do it like this? Um, was it helpful? I'd love that. Share some ideas. I, I've just found when I teach other people, I learn the stuff better. All right, so hey. Uh, go out and try some new stuff this year, would you? And uh, I just want to thank you personally. Thank you so much for being a listener to the People and Projects podcast. Uh, once again, I love feedback from listeners. So if you have any questions or comments after an episode, if you ever want to introduce an episode, um, you know, whatever, I would just love to be able to hear from you. But thank you for taking the time to join today. I hope you have a great end to the year, a great start to next year, and that you have a lot of success. Look forward to our next conversation. Thanks for joining today. See ya.